there's so many stories of him, you know, when he was in prison. Um, different strokes actor is it? I think it's Todd Bridges. Um, Todd Bridges. He told a story oh, that Ramirez. Sean Penn. Yeah, Sean Penn was in prison with him as well. Um, yeah. But I remember Todd Bridges told the story of Ramirez used to shake his cell and basically say that he was going to get him. Um, and apparently, the the reports. That Ramirez tried to escape from prison a few times. I'm not aware of any escape attempts. I read I that somewhere. But now the thing is, why I'm kind of bringing this up to you is because there's obviously been a a lot written about him, and you know some of some of things must have been added on, you know, to increase the so-called you know mystique of yes. of the case. But um, you've never been phased by his, you know, the the way he's portrayed to him. Or to you, he's just another, he's just a bad guy that you guys have to put away. He's nothing more than another human. Yeah. That's all he is. And is that kind of a mentality that is shared by most detectives? I can only, you know, I, I, I can only speak for myself. Okay. And I know, I know my partner, Frank, and there when Frank wasn't concerned about him at all. Yeah. Uh, I would think, I would like to think that most are level-headed and, you know, we just think, hey, he's, he's human. Uh, somebody who is, let us say, very deeply religious. Well, as a matter of fact, during the investigation, I had a very close friend of mine give me a prayer card. He said, here, keep this with you and keep it in your wallet. You're dealing with the devil. You know, and so someone like that that was extremely religious, extremely to one side, this may have affected him because, due to his belief. But yeah. when you get it down to its simplest form, uh, Satanism is nothing more than another form of religion. And religion is having faith, and faith is believing in something that logic says isn't so. Yeah. So there's no difference in his religion. I just don't believe like him. You know, that was it. And, and there was a, at one point in time, I really got angry. And, and I want to clarify something that. A skeptic, uh, escape attempt that never occurred. I'd have, while he was in custody here, I would have known about it immediately. Yeah, like, yeah. We monitored everything, and I know it didn't happen up in San Quentin because I got word there was a young deputy, a female deputy sheriff, that uh, inserted a Bible into uh, Richard's cell, and there were. There were explicit instructions his door was not to be open with less than two deputies and a sergeant okay present he was a high profile guy want nothing to happen and she opened the door and got a uh, bible into him and i heard about this and i went through the roof i didn't care that it was a bible uh i went through the roof i wanted her fired i wanted her demoted i wanted her getting out of it because I said, she said, God told me to give you this. And I said, what happens if God tells her to kill him? Mm. What happens if God gives her other instructions? Yeah. We got to separate religion and work here at this facility, ladies and gentlemen. So I was quite upset. So I'd hear about everything. Mm. Okay. And, um, you know, what was he like in court? He seemed like he was almost a bit of a, you know, he was a bit of a showman. Um, he, you know, he pleaded not guilty and he had a pentagram drawn on his hand where he, I think he still said, Hail Satan. Early on, he had displayed a satanic symbol and proclaimed, Hail Satan. Hail Satan. He's a prima donna. He's an egotistical guy, uh, but he played up to the cameras and he knew what he was yeah. doing. He wanted it. He had an image that he wanted to pull. The, the courts appointed a psychiatrist to go in and evaluate him. And Richard threw him out after 30 minutes, a little, little less than 30 minutes, threw him out, didn't want to talk to him because he didn't want people to think that he was crazy. Okay. He knew what he was doing. So yeah. he, he, this didn't phase him, you know. Uh, his final words publicly here in L.A. County was when they were taken out of the court into the bus for transportation back to the jail facility. And he said... Uh, See you at Disneyland. Somebody yeah. said this would be easy. Yeah, see you. Yeah. Big deal. That's always went with the territory. I'll see you in Disneyland. He, he asked us, because uh, we sat with him about 
four or five days uh, in a row after his conviction, after it's all over with, he's been sentenced to death, and now we're getting ready for transportation up to San Quentin. And we talked to him. Matter of fact, there was a made-for-television movie out at the time, and we actually watched the movie with him. And uh, he didn't get to watch it himself when he was alone because he was uh, some kind of disciplinary violation. And okay. So we just went down there, and at that time, we're sure it's homicide. It's pretty much we get what we want as long as it's within reason. We wanted to watch the movie with him. Yeah. So we did. And... We talked to him. We got talked about a lot of stuff in those four or five days. And everything was between him and I and, and Frank. And so the only request he had, first off, he wanted to know if we were going to go up and be witnesses to his execution. Mm-hmm. And my partner, Salerno, said, you damn right, I'll be there. And he asked me, and I just said, I don't know, Rich. You want me there? or go, you don't. I've seen enough of that. You know, I've seen it in Vietnam. I've yeah. seen it on the streets here. I don't care if I can go along. And he says, well, I'd like you there. I said, okay, I'll be there. Then. He's kind of established his... Uh, it wasn't a friendship. It was just we were able to get along with each other. And uh, so he said yeah. he, wanted to, he wanted to fly to... Uh, he didn't want to go on the bus to San Quentin. He wanted to fly. Okay. And I said, okay, we'll arrange for a flight. We'll go up there. We'll fly you up there. So after we left, I told my partner, you know, we've got this six passenger plane and the department will fly us up there with no problem. And, but I don't want to go. And he said, why not? And I said, because if Richard acts up on the plane, we're going to have to shoot him. Yeah. So there's no place to move around. We're going to have to kill him. Yeah. And if he dies on that plane, the public's going to go nuts. Well, why are Gil and Frank taking him back there? Yeah. And so we just put him on a regular plane. We we put him on our sheriff's plane, and they took him up there with regular guys from our transportation bureau. And when they did, they said, Gil, we wish you'd have been there with us. Some guy, they had two uh, guys from San Quentin, had to be at least six foot five. They could have taken off their shirts and pinned their bands on their chest. They looked like they were tight ends for a professional football team. And when Richard walked in, they just told him in no short terms that this wasn't Disneyland. He was nothing more than a number up here. He wasn't. He was nothing. Yeah. He'd get his clothes off, get naked, and get naked now. And they said Richard's eyes were ready to bug out then. He was scared. And I said, well, that would have been all worth it to see, but he made it up there. All right. The movie that you were referring to, was that the one, uh, was that Manhunt Search for the Night Stalker, the 1989 movie? Yes. yes. That's the, f- yeah, you were you were played by actor Adolfo Martinez, if I'm not mistaken. Martinez. Yes. yes. And that's the first movie. That is how I um, be- became aware of Richard Ramirez the first time. I was, I think I was about seven or eight <laughs> when i watched it the first time and um yeah that is that is how i heard about him was through that movie um what was his he had shockingly enough he had a massive fan base uh like a woman you know women used to you know love him and whatever what was that like did they show up in court yes yes some of them did some very attractive ladies and Made me want to become a criminal, you know, get a following like that. He he did. Uh, He had, he had a very large following that he's got uh, still to this day an extremely large following. Not so much of women now. Now it's about everybody. And I'm getting told on social media, (laughs) there's somebody out there that has started a a movement saying that uh, we framed Richard. uh, I've had, yeah. I've had comments. Um, it's probably this. It, it could be the same person. I've had comments on because I've done a few videos. I did. I did the one video right in the beginning. You were my first episode on the podcast, and um, I had comments on that video, and I had, I did a solo video on Richard Ramirez as well, and I had comments on that also saying that he was framed, he was innocent. Um, it's it's strange. Um, yeah, 
they they yeah. said framed he's innocent we lied it yeah. was the kangaroo court they've done everything now and all i do they i've had people tell me that they wish i were dead richard should be alive and i should be dead for what i did and i was asked i was doing a podcast for two years we just finished uh, a couple of months ago about a month and a half ago with mr george lopez he acted yes. comedian and he asked me on his podcast uh what did you do what do you think when you get that stuff and i said i laugh there's nothing i could do uh, I'm 73 years old. I've had a full, complete life. I had a job. I have an income. And I'm happy with my family and friends yeah. and the way everything is gone. And I know that he was scrutinized. There was absolutely nothing illegal, unlawful, or any lies that went on yeah. in that trial. And some poor individual is uh, sitting back behind a computer and starts talking stuff because he can be brave, but they can be brave. And there's no doubt in my mind, he doesn't have a job, doesn't have an income, doesn't have much of a life. I don't know how many friends he's got, but God bless him. And he probably voted for Feinstein. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, um, well, th th there's basically, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's actually a psychological, there's a condition called hybristophilia, which is a condition where you are, people get infatuated with um, notorious criminals. And they they fantasize about them and whatever. So obviously this individual kind of surely falls into that category. And um, but you know, sure back to his female back to his female fan base. Um he actually got married in prison to uh, Doreen Leoy. And there was a strange interview that I watched with her where she you know the reporter basically asked her, or the interviewer basically asked her, well, you know, this guy's the to many the personification of evil. And she's just like, well, you know, she doesn't see him that way. No one knows him like she does. I mean, it's just. I can't help the way the world looks at him. They don't know him the way I do. I mean, she deserved him. And I understand. I, I don't know because when he did get married to her, uh, up until that time, I was told that Richard was going to uh, wanted to talk to me again because he was good for four more murders down here in L.A. County that he would top two and but he needed uh, to be about seven years be in custody before he'd be ready to talk about him openly and i said okay we'll, 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 we'll wait well just before that interview came about because i was contacted by mr phil carlo who wrote the wrote a book on the night stalker okay and carlo tells me he says hey gil rich says he's ready to talk to you you're ready to go up there and i said, okay, we'll tell Rich if he's ready to, ready to tell me the truth and not bullshit me like he did the dep deputies down here, I'll go up there. Because in my mind, yeah, a trip for me to San Quentin is like a trip to Disneyland for him. He doesn't get this attention. Yeah. <laughs> now he's going to get me up there and get the attention. Well, before that trip happened, he got married. And I got contacted by the media, and I said it was a mockery of the criminal justice system because he was put in there for punishment, not for rehabilitation. Yeah. And he was sentenced to death. Number two, it was a mock through the sacrament of marriage. He was never going to consummate his, cons consummate his marriage. So why does he have the right to go ahead and get married? To, to belittle so many others. And so he obviously got to see what I said. It was on national news, so then it was he no longer wanted to talk to me <laughs> well he had a you know his he had a he had a rough childhood as yeah. well now the yeah. the subject always comes up of nature versus nurture you know the reports his dad was abusive um his cousin who he looked up to mike i think he also served in vietnam if i'm not mistaken but um he yes, shot he his wife in front of richard i think when he was like well he was young he was like 12 or 13 or whatever and um he used to sleep in the graveyard to you know, find peace he used to sleep in the cemetery to get away from home and i also read that his mother was a devout catholic and that she used to take against one of these stories i'm not sure whether it's true or not but apparently she used to take him to watch executions at the local prison which doesn't sound that i'm 
No, I, I'm not, not aware of that. I, I don't think I'd ever heard about that because we did we did look into the family background. And, uh, yeah. And mother was, they, they were Catholics, they were devout. Uh, as a matter of fact, as it turns out, Richard was, uh, after the documentary came out in, in 2021, yeah. I was contacted by someone who turns out to be the niece of Richard Ramirez. Okay. And Richard had been molesting her from age uh, six until she was 12. And we found out about it, and she's doing wonderful, you know. And when she told the family, finally opened up to the family at age 18, uh, they condemned her, including Richard was her father's brother. I mean, wow. the whole family condemned her. Nobody believed her. How could she talk bad about Richie? When I finally started to say something about what had happened to me, they did not believe me. And this went on, and the mother, like I said, everybody condemned her. And they did not accept the, the mother nor Richard's sister actually forgave her for coming out and saying what she did about Richard. But the dad finally broke down and said he was sorry. He didn't realize that his brother really was. Now he understood that he really was violating his own daughter. Wow. He's like, and um, did you ever meet his dad? Well, I met him in court. I didn't okay. go up and shake his hand or anything. <laughs> uh, his dad came out and testified. His dad, uh, his dad was a good piece of work for, for us. He yeah. testified that Richard had been back there, and then I found uh, a writer that wrote an article in the paper the day after Richard's arrest down in El Paso, and I tracked him down to Florida, and I asked him if he remembered writing the article. He said yes, and I said, well, are you ready for a vacation in L.A.? And so we flew him up to L.A. and gave him a few days here. He testified and then went back, and so he... Everything the father had said, he just blew him right out of the water.